Heavenly Father, be present with us this morning. Help us to hear your word, to feel your love, to carry both with us always. Amen. Please be seated. So after the 8 o'clock, I need to begin uh, this sermon with a bit of a disclaimer. If uh, you hear, it's become a, a little bit of a joke that anytime I leave Los Angeles, I come back with some sort of new ailment. Uh, and last week I was in North Carolina. And uh, so if you hear me speaking a little strangely or see me wincing, uh, I'm not having a stroke. Uh, I have a, a root canal that was done when I was in the sixth grade, uh, is now infected. So uh, say a prayer for me, uh, and, and, uh, and I believe God might be sending me a message about staying close, so there you go. Okay, preamble over. Good morning, all saints. It is a good morning. It is a good morning, despite all of these things. It is a good morning anytime we get to dwell in the house of God, and especially when we get a gospel lesson about what to do when God comes to dwell in your house. I love the story of Mary and Martha. You've probably heard it before. We've, we, we hear it in church. We hear it in Sunday school. If you're like me and you have weird friends, they go, don't be such a Martha. Need better ones. But uh, this story of Mary and Martha sticks with us. It's one that continues to carry over. And this gospel lesson, I have to say, always brings me back to the moments of my youth. Uh, you see, I was always one that wanted to be a good boy growing up. And so even all the way back as kindergarten, I can rem remember being in Miss Dara's class and on the board, Miss Dara had this big board with all these frogs, and the frogs had our stu the students' names on them. And if you were good, your frog lived on the lily pad. But if you were bad, your frog fell off the lily pad into the water. And so I was very proud that I was always on the lily pad. And I was so proud that when my friends ended up falling off the lily pad. I wouldn't talk to him anymore. <laughs> and this went on and on, so much so that my mom and Miss Dara had to have a conversation where they cooked up a scheme where they would frame me for something, and my frog would fall off the lily pad, and I learned how corrupt the system can be. <laughs> and that natural inclination carried over, unfortunately, into my faith life. And so as I was growing up, I was really, really concerned, not just about being good, but what do I need to do to get into heaven? That was my primary goal. What is it that we need? And I remember I would ask Father Bob all the time, my priest growing up, I said, man, just give me the rule book. If I have the rule book, I'll know what to do, I'll know what not to do, and we'll be good. Unfortunately, Father Bob would tell me over and over, Michael, the whole point of Jesus is that we don't need a rule book anymore. And because of Miss Dara and the frogs, I didn't believe him. And so I continue to explore that question because I felt like there was more that I could do. There was always more saintly lives I could leave. I could go to confession. I could come to church more often. I could pray harder. I could do enough to earn my way to heaven. And so every time we revisit this moment in the gospel, every time we hear this story, I feel this conflict personally. I get it. I understand it. So let's, let's paint the picture here. What we find, Jesus is coming to the house of Mary and Martha, and both are so excited to have the Son of God himself dwell within your home. They can't help but get to work and what they know needs to be done. For Mary, it makes perfect sense. Jesus comes. She is not going to waste or miss this moment. As Jesus comes to sit amongst them, she finds herself sitting at his feet to listen, to dialogue, to be, and to dwell in his magnificent presence, soaking up every bit that he might offer. And now for Mary, excuse me, for Martha, she hears that God is coming. 
And she is overwhelmed by it, knows it's important, but also knows what a responsibility it is to be able to serve and care out for this God. And so she gets to work, finding ways to serve, to continue to honor her guests, to honor God herself and all that she is and does. Now, neither perspective that we find this morning is wrong. In fact, both are truly good. But what we see is that instead of this pitting against Mary and Martha, in this moment, we see Jesus reveal what it means to be a person of faith, to be a child of God. And he does so by pointing at Mary and saying that she has made the better choice because Mary knows that as Martha has continued to work, to serve, to get frustrated with the fact that Jesus has not acknowledged that service, has not lifted her up for it, has not asked Mary to join in on the hard work, that instead Mary is doing exactly what many of us are called to do, to dwell in that presence of God, to know that we are enough simply by being God's people, by living into that relationship with him. This dichotomy that the world can make of whether we should be Mary or whether we should be Martha is a false one. Instead, it's not be Mary or Martha. It is be Mary before Martha. Because when we know whose we are, when we dwell with this person, with this God who loves us, sustains us, and has created us, we live out a life of service, of love, of transformation. We do really well in trying hard to earn that salvation. So many of us might spend our whole lives trying to be good boys and good girls because that's what we think God wants from us. In fact, it couldn't be further from the truth. God did not come to make us good boys and good girls. God came to bring the dead to life and to have life abundantly. To know our prize is not a pat on the back, to have your frog stay on the lily pad, but instead to dwell in the waves of grace, the embracing arms of love, to have a spirit and a life transformed by that love that then is lived out for each and every one of us. That is what we do when we come to meet God in this way. But it begins by first understanding who we are, by the mere fact that God has made us in love. And some of us are bad at dwelling with God. Some of us have a hard time sitting in that peace and that silence. We all want to be doers, especially here. Have you ever had somebody reach out to you, a friend of yours who said, you know, we haven't caught up in a while. We need to give, let's, let's get on the phone. And so you do, and then for the next 45 minutes, they just speak about themselves and everything that they need and everything that's going on with them and what they hope for and what they need, and they say, all right, good talking to you, goodbye. Just me? (laughs) I, I probably do need better friends, don't I? For some of us, that is our prayer life. For some of us, that is the relationship we have with God. We pray and we ask, God, I need this. I hope for this. I'm praying for this person. I want this. I hope that you know about this. I hope that thing is good here. But what kind of a relationship is that? What kind of a relationship is one when our prayer life becomes a monologue and not a dialogue? The thing about it is, God does speak, my friend. God continues to move in ways that we can't even imagine. But we're uncomfortable opening a Bible we haven't read and talking to a God who we might not talk to all that well. And so perhaps this is a time and this is a season in which we might work just a little bit harder to do less of the talking and more of the listening, to open up that scripture to find places where we can go through it and see what comes up in us, to sit in God's presence and be, 
to dwell amongst him in our homes, to sit before the Eucharist, to even pray in new and unfamiliar ways, like even a rosary. Our God does speak in a multitude of ways, but are we bold enough to listen? If we were, in this church, this church universal, but especially all saints, where we are full of Marthas, full of those who know how to do, to serve compassionately, to love deeply, to welcome greatly. We know how to do that well. I wonder if we know how to dwell with that God just as well. I wonder if we are able to rest in the knowledge of not of how great we have done, but who God has made us to be versus who the world tells us who we are. I have seen no better example of this than just yesterday. Yesterday, as Ken and Andrea mentioned, we celebrated the life eternal of Debbie Alon. And so as we heard over and over again from our different speakers who offered remembrances, how much and the many ways in which Debbie changed lives, transformed and served, it was a powerful moment in witness to a life And so we finished with Debbie's husband, Alam. He sat down, and I came out to begin my homily. And so I started a little bit, and then all of a sudden, right there, Alam just raises his hand. That's odd for a sermon, but it's okay. And I said, yes, Alam? He said, I have one more thing to say. What could I do? So I said, Alam, come on up. And so he came back up to the microphone. And instead of speaking about Debbie in particular, he spoke about the 19-year-old woman who, driving under the influence, actually hit Debbie and killed her with her car. And he sat there, and as he expressed what he thought, he didn't condemn, he didn't say that she is this one act. What he said was, I know that society has failed you. I know that society has failed this girl. But my angel, Debbie, has been taken from this world and gone to heaven. And I think that this is an opportunity for you, this 19-year-old woman, to be an angel on this world in her place. It was a moment and a remembrance of the humanity of who we are and made in God's image. None of us are the worst thing that we have ever done. And frankly, none of us are the best thing that we have ever done. But we are made in the image of this God who loves, who continues to uphold, who calls us into new life and a life of love, not because we need to earn anything, not because we need to be anything, but because out of this relationship of love and life, we can do nothing else but serve, but love, and transform this world. But it begins with each and every one of us. And so perhaps in this season, even when our frogs might fall off the lily pad and we might feel like bad boys and bad girls, we might know that we are much more. We might know whose we are. And in knowing whose we are, we would know who we are. And that in a life lived, it's beginning like Mary, would see a life lived out like that of Martha. May that be our witness and prayer. May that be how, what we know regardless of rule books, lily pads, but only Jesus. Amen.